Shalom, this is Amir Tzafati from Behold Israel. We're about to have a wonderful interview with Dr. Seth Postel on the issue of the deity of Christ. This is one of the most amazing and important topics that uh, are overlooked by so many people or misunderstood by most Christians around the world. It is essential to believe in Messiah, in Jesus, as nothing less than God if we want to be saved. And so join me and, and Dr. Seth Postel in exploring what the scriptures have to say about the deity of the Jewish Messiah of Yeshua, Jesus. Shalom Seth, how are you? Hey Amir, good to be with you. Yeah, Dr. Seth Postel, I've known you for almost my entire life as a believer since 1993. Yeah. And you were just a brand new immigrant to Israel. You didn't even know if you're going to stay here. Correct. Uh, new Jersey guy coming to Israel. Not my fault. Not I your was, fault. I didn't I'm not going to hold it born. against you, <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, but um, and we've known each other since the military service. Yeah. You were, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the infantry. I was. Exactly. And uh, we. And then, of course, you left Israel for origin. I mean, originally you wanted to leave for three years, and it ended up being nine years. You completed your uh, degree. Uh, you were mm -hmm. actually MA and the doctorate in the US. Correct. Can you tell us in a few words how how did you find your faith in the Messiah? Yeah, so I mean I grew up in a Jewish family. I grew up in, in New Jersey. We lived in an area where pretty much everybody in my neighborhood was Jewish. We had I think two Gentiles on our whole street. Everybody else was Jewish. Wow. Um, strong sense of Jewish identity. I had to go to Hebrew school once a week. And I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest yes. version, sort of a shorter version. But what ended up happening was at some point my mother met a Jewish lady who started to talk to her about Jesus. And my mother was very offended and very curious. And what ended up happening was my mother started to uh, do some searching. Wow. And at some point she came to the conclusion, this crazy conclusion that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Wow. My father cried. He was angry. He said, why have you betrayed our people? Long story short, my father started to ask a lot of questions. And um, again, it's, it's an amazing story, but you know, growing up, the worst curse word that I could hear of all the curse words in my house was Jesus Christ. My father, after a period of wrestling of a few months, he could not deny that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He came to faith. And uh, it was soon after that that I started to ask lots of questions. And um, I, I, I fell in love with this man named Jesus. I'd never met a more beautiful person. I also sensed that there was something seriously lacking in my own life. I, I also had, I guess, a fear of God. I understood that there was something wrong in my own life. And as I started to read and study the scriptures, became convinced that Jesus wow. is my Lord, Savior, Messiah, and so, Amazing. yeah. Amazing. And you're a doctor now and you're a professor at Israel College of the Bible, ICB. Correct. And um, not long ago I attended one of your lectures on the, the deity of Christ in the eyes of, or as it is being reflected by the writings of the New Testament writers. And uh, that wasn't actually a, a lecture that was supposed to be a sermon to convince non-Jews to believe in Jesus as much as a, a very academic exposure of how first century, second temple period Jews already then presented Jesus as God, which is revolutionary. So I guess, you know, the idea behind the lecture, as we think about it, was that, you know, I often hear, also among some people who claim to be believers, that, at, that, that Gentile Christians at some point twisted our faith. Yes. That at some point they turned Jesus into a fully divine being. At some point Christians distorted our faith and started to believe in the Trinity, but everybody knows that there's no way Second Temple Jews could ever believe that Jesus was fully God or the Trinity. It doesn't mention the Trinity in the New Testament and therefore it's a distortion of our faith. And so what I wanted to do was to show 
um, just by looking at the evidence of the New Testament without trying to convince people that Jesus yes. is God, does the New Testament, do the New Testament authors present Jesus as God? Mm. Because if that's the case, then what you have is a faith tied to Second Temple period. In other exactly. words, there was no Gentile, later Gentile distortion, yes. but believing that Jesus is God is a very Jewish thing. Mm. And so that's what, that's what the point of the lecture is. So were. let's go back to the time of the Jewish world of the Second Temple period. We all know that at that time there was no New Testament yet and therefore when the Bible, in, when the New Testament says it is written or the scriptures, it is talking only about the Old Testament obviously. And we know that most if not all the Jewish people at the time, they knew the Old Testament pretty good and one of the most common and the most important prayers or something that Jewish people recite is the Shema. The hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Correct. This is their flagship and reason why they cannot accept the deity of Christ and the concept of the Trinity because God is one. Correct. So hear, O Israel, Correct. the Lord your God, the Lord is one. How do you refer to such a claim? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's really interesting. I. I I want to refer to a book that was written that, that was recently written by a Jewish scholar, not a believer. He's a, a religious Jewish man from the United States named Benjamin Summer. And he wrote a book called The Bodies of God. The Bodies of God. It's a hard book to read. It's not an easy book to understand. But basically what he claims at the end of his book is that if we take the biblical documents seriously, and even if we take early Judaism, Judaism seriously, there's absolutely no problem. Judaism ought to have no problem with the belief that God is triune. There's no issue whatsoever. Now he goes on to say, now of course we reject Jesus as a false messiah, right? So what he does is he goes through all the, the biblical literature and he starts with the Torah. And uh, it's really interesting that when you start to see the way that the, the Torah itself presents the unity of God, you come to a conclusion that you have a foundation well set in place to believe in a triune God. Amazing. Completely, completely resting on what the Torah itself testifies about who God is. So according to the Torah, according to the Torah, um, God meets Israel at Mount Sinai, right? right. He, he meets Israel at Mount Sinai and interestingly enough, we see that God is dwelling at the summit of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is built, it's, it's, it's got three levels of holiness, if you, if you think of it that way. God is at the top and only Moses can go there. In the middle, you've got a class of priests that could go up with Moses and have like a fellowship dinner, right? Joshua could go there. And then only at the bottom of the hill could the rest of Israel go, okay? Well, that's a, that, that actually becomes the foundation of what the tabernacle is going yes. to become. You've got the Holy of Holies and the high priest that goes in, okay. So here's what's really interesting. So according to the Torah, according to the Torah, God dwells on Mount Sinai. He's dwelling in Mount Sinai. And then Moses, at the end of, of Exodus, he finishes the tabernacle. The glory of God settles in the tabernacle. And can I, I'd like yeah, to read, it's course. really amazing. So I love it, that story from Exodus. It's so if we look at Exodus 40, yeah. towards the end of Exodus, something amazing happens. Okay? Yeah. In Exodus 40, verse 34. Exodus 40, verse 34. Uh -huh. Exodus okay. 30, verse 44. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, mm -hmm. and the glory, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So now God moves house. Yep. He used to live on the top of Mount Sinai. Now he moves into the tabernacle. Notice, Moses, verse 34, was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Okay, so where's the presence of God now? In the tabernacle. In the tabernacle. Where's God? He's in the tabernacle. And in fact, you go now to Leviticus 1. It's pretty spectacular. And you may, you'll notice this in Hebrew. In English, you'll miss this. It says the name of the book is Vaikra, yep. and he called, right? Yep. But notice it says, and he called to Moses. Who's he? You actually have to go to the preceding book to get the subject of, yep. and he called, which is the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And then it goes on. It says, and the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from where? From the tent of meeting. Mm -hmm. 
Where's the Lord? In the tent of meeting. He's in the tent of meeting, correct? So according to the Torah, the one God, he always are the Lord of God, the Lord is one. He dwells in the tent of meeting, right? Yep. Okay. But that's not the whole picture. Go to Deuteronomy 26 now. Yep. Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy 26. Yeah. Verse 15. 26, verse 15. Deuteronomy okay. 26, verse 15. Yep. Where does God dwell? Deuteronomy 26, verse 16. 15. Oh, 15. You can read it. Yes. He says in verse 15. Moses is praying. Thing. Yes, Moses is praying. And he's saying the following thing. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven. Stop. Where does God dwell? In heaven. Okay. So, in fact, the Torah teaches there are two temples. Up in heaven and one on earth. There's a there's the real one in heaven. There's a copy on earth. Okay. So how can he be in both at exactly. the same time? Exactly. In other words, what's really amazing is that the Torah actually teaches that you have the copy and the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord lives in the copy. Really. It's as if the glory of God dresses in tent. He puts on cloth and dwells among his people yeah. without ceasing to be God in heaven. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It you sounds know. like the Gospel of yeah, John. exactly. It's, it's just like John, absolutely. the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Yeah, and, and one of the things that hit me when I read Exodus uh, 33, and you, you probably know that very well also, is uh, that's my, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Old Testament. It says this, in verse 9, And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And then he says, All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his own tent. And so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp. But, and then, of course, few a few verses later, you see that Moses cannot see God. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> so the Torah, the Torah presents something really quite spectacular, and that is that God is one. But this one God can dwell simultaneous, simultaneously in a number of places without ceasing to be the one true God. And so, you bring up, for instance, the, the angel of the Lord. Now, I don't yeah. even like the, the translation angel of the Lord. Probably the messenger of the Lord would be mm -hmm. a, better, Correct. a better presentation. But you think about in Exodus 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. It says that in Exodus 3, it's really interesting, and I'll even go there. So the, the messenger of the Lord, verse 2, appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So then it says in verse 4, when the Lord saw, the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So who's in the bush? He's in the midst right? of the who's bush. Who's in the bush? But is it the messenger of the Lord yes. or is it God? And so what you do here, what you see in the Torah already is you have a very interesting presentation of the unity of God. And so the fact that the one true God can, can come down and live in a bush without ceasing to be the one true God of heaven, does not, it doesn't contradict his oneness. And interestingly enough, another very famous passage, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, mm -hmm. an amazing passage. In 1 Kings chapter 8, God then moves, he, he moves home. He moves from tabernacle to the temple. To temple. But here's what's interesting. And again, I won't, you know, it's a very long passage, but in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon, after he builds the temple, you have the glory of God that settles into the, to the Holy of Holies, the Dvir, the Holy of Holies. So the, the, we know that God now is dwelling inside his temple. But here's what's remarkable. Now that God's presence is dwelling in the temple, Solomon's whole prayer, because he prays God, and when we face this temple, may you hear from your holy habitation in, in heaven, heaven and forgive us. Yes. So, so let's say, so does the Torah teach there are two different gods? Is, is Solomon teaching there are two different gods? No, he's teaching something that is foundational for our faith, that God can actually choose to dwell with his people in a very special way. That's God's desire. 
to, spell, to dwell with us, whether it's in the messenger of the Lord, whether it's in the glory of God in the tabernacle. Or the and word whether, of God, the memra of the Lord. Exactly. Yeah. Whether, it's, whether it's the flesh of Jesus, mm -hmm. the tabernacle of God, the glory of God dwells with us completely and fully mm. without ceasing to be God in heaven. Yeah. And this is the Torah. Let's go to Genesis 1.26. Sure. Genesis 1.26, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to see if you look at it as, as some sort of what we call old school. Uh, Genesis 1.26 is saying the following thing. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the flesh of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that it creeps on the earth. Who, who do you think Genesis 1.26 is really speaking about? Let us. Sure. Okay. So here's something that the way that I operate, and, and again, I, I, because I, I realized as a Jewish believer that I needed to explain my faith from the Hebrew Bible. Yes. And so I believe the New Testament. I take the New Testament as the Word of God. But as a rule of thumb, I always, I allow the, New, the Old Testament to lead me to the New Testament mm -hmm. rather than the New Testament kind of reinterpreting the Old Testament. Yeah. Why do I do that? Because I believe that we have to speak to our people. I believe that we, that, and I also, by the way, believe that the New Testament authors understood the Old Testament correctly. So what do I do with this? Well, as you know, Rashi would say that, that God in his humility is actually saying, so he's, he's speaking with the angels, right? He just wants to show that he's humble. And so he, let us make man in our image. He's speaking with the angels, okay? Now, there's no question. Rashi is one of the most revered rabbis from among the rabbinical establishment that came after Jesus. Oh, a, a thousand years, years exactly. after, 11 years, so 1100. He's, tr he's trying, 1100 years after Jesus, he's trying now to settle Genesis 126 Correct. in his own way. Correct. And obviously the reason that he's going that direction is not necessarily because he's trying to understand the text, but be because he's trying to refute exactly. the Christian interpretation. And so the question then becomes, is this speaking about the angels? The, the, there's a few problems with this interpretation. One of the biggest of problems is that creation in the Old Testament is an act that exclusively belongs to God. Exactly. And so angels cannot create. And right, once he says, yes, let us make. So this is, you know, there are, there are acts of God that separate God from, you know, the creator from the created. And one of the major acts that separates the creator from the created is creation. Exactly. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, if you look in the context, do you see any angels in chapter one? Absolutely not. There are none. So, and I might surprise you here, but I want you to notice something here. If we're looking for clues in the text, who's speaking? Let us make man in our image. I believe that the best commentary in scripture is always going to be scripture. So let's look in the text. Yeah. Is God alone in this chapter? Is he alone? And here's what's really amazing. Look in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Yep, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Everybody knows this. Exactly. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Okay, so here's what's really remarkable. Here's what's really remarkable. If I, I, just, if I just wanna lean on the text, okay, I don't wanna try to, I, I don't wanna kinda of read the New Testament back into this passage. Let's just use the text. Here's what's really amazing. In Genesis one, God is one but he's not alone. Yeah. God is one and he's not alone. God is there, verses one, and who's with him? The Spirit of God. And by virtue of the fact in verse 26 that God says, let us make man in our image, and you look for oh, who's speaking, what you have, there's no other choice, we say exegetically, than to say at the very least, at the very least, you have God and, and his Spirit. spirit. That's already an amazing, when we talk about trying to convince our people and trying to say, listen, it's tr totally biblical to believe that the one God exists in more than one persons. And so here we have a classic example that God and the Spirit of God are together creating the world. Now what's interesting, Proverbs, 
the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. How did God create the universe? Through his wisdom. His wisdom is the spirit of God. Now, of course, of course, elsewhere in the scriptures, uh, we see, for instance, in, in, in Psalm 33, that God not only creates the, word of the world through his wisdom or through his spirit, but also through the word. Also through the word. And so what I would just simply say here is that if we're just allowing the text, we already have a, an amazing foundation mm -hmm. for recognizing this unity of God, the one God who creates, but a plurality of persons. Yes. So we have the Spirit of God, we have God, we have the messenger of the Lord, mm -hmm. right? We have the glory of God who settles into the temple, we have the face of God, and so all of this gives us an amazing foundation for realizing the doctrine of the Trinity. The word Trinity never appears in the New Testament, but it's simply a word that captures what the scriptures teach. The one God triune nature. exists in a plurality of persons. That's yes. completely biblical and it rests entirely in the Torah. Mm. Do you think there are clear passages in the Old Testament that point at the divine identity of the Messiah. Yes. So interestingly enough, even before we talk about the deity of Jesus, okay, which I believe the New Testament teaches that there's a that Jesus Absolutely. is divine, but let's take this this the discussion back even a little bit farther. Does the Hebrew Bible present a divine Messiah? And I could take you to many passages, right? We could go to Isaiah, we could go to uh, we could go to the book of Psalms, but one book that's often overlooked that I think is a key book in this discussion is Daniel. Daniel. Now, if you look in Daniel chapter 7, I want to show you something amazing. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 7. Yeah, Daniel now chapter 7. Now, it's in Aramaic. Obviously, right? but okay. the English is here. There it's, you go. You got the English, you got yep. the Hebrew translation. Yep. But I want you to notice something in the Aramaic. Of days. Yeah. There's something incredibly important in the Aramaic that people overlook. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me just kind of paint a picture for you. Okay. I'm going to paint a picture for you. The book of Daniel, really, interestingly enough, it, it has three parts. Chapter 1 until 2, four, verse 4 is Hebrew. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 4, the second half until the end of chapter 7, Aramaic. Chapter 8 through 12, Hebrew. Now, the way that this works, it just, there's a beautiful picture, but the first half of Daniel, 1 through 6, is a narrative. Stories of Daniel and his friends. Chapter 7, chapter 7 through 12 are Daniel's visions. Correct. The hinge chapter, which is in Aramaic, seven. is chapter 7. So chapter 7 has a, a double purpose. Number one, the first purpose is it's part of the Aramaic section of Daniel. So it connects to the Aramaic section. But, so it, it connects to the first half of the book. But it's a hinge in that. It's the it, first one of the visions. It's the first one of the visions. So it, it, it provides a hinge passage. It's, clear, it's the most important passage for the theology of Daniel. Now, what's going on there? Amazing. In the narrative section, Daniel and his friends continue to be tested to worship things that aren't God. Bow down to things that aren't God. To pray to things that aren't God. So bow down to things that aren't God, chapter 3. To pray to things that aren't God, chapter 6. Okay? Well, a key word that shows up again and again is the word palach in Aramaic. Palach. You know the word in Hebrew, pulchan. Yes. What's pulchan? It's, it's worship. It's ritual, yeah. It's ritual, ritual. that's tied worship, to things yeah. you ascribe to divine beings. Mm -hmm. So here we go. All through da the first half of Daniel and the narrative of Daniel, Daniel and his friends are willing to die as to not worship things that aren't God. Yep. They refuse to give palach to, to anything, anything but, that, God. but God. Okay, well guess what happens in chapter 7? The key chapter, the whole book hangs together in this one chapter. Mm -hmm. It ties the chapter together. So notice verses 13 and 14. Yep. I, I kept just, looking in yeah. the night visions and behold the, the clouds of heaven, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. So you think, okay, he's just a man. No, where's he coming from? He's coming from heaven. heaven. And he came up to the Ancient of Days as was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Now, what's the word there for serve? 
actually worship. Worship, it's Fal the same yeah, word. It's yefalchun. Yefalchule. Yefalchunle. In other mm -hmm. words, here's what's, here's what's amazing. Why would the book of Daniel, in the most important chapter in the whole book, everywhere else teach that that word is only used for deity? And that, here. And here suddenly. He's just to, serving some. To consummate the kingdom yeah. of God, all the tribes, tongues, and nations are now worshiping the Son of Man. The Son of Man has to participate in the divine identity. He has to be God. If not, this chapter contradicts the whole book yeah. and everything that Daniel's been teaching. Yeah. And so when Jesus quotes this passage at his trial, what do the religious leaders say? Blasphemy. Yeah. He's blasphemed. Why? Because, because Jesus is identifying himself with the divine Son of Man. Exactly. This has to be God. And, and, and people don't understand that the blasphemy was never held as he, he claims to be the Messiah. No. In their mind, Messiah could have been a human being. It's the fact that he claims to have divine nature, that him and the Father are one. He equals himself to God. And that's the blasphemy. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. So there are a lot of people that would read the New Testament and argue that Jesus never claimed to be God. The crazy thing is that in the, in the religious people that kept constantly wanted That's to stone him. That's what they accused him, him for. They kept, so if ever you wonder what Jesus is really claiming, just check with the religious people that wanted to stone Absolutely. him. Why would we claim to understand Jesus 2,000 years better 2,000 years later, later than the religious, religious people that actually were there yes, and heard what he was claiming exactly. and wanted to stone him. Why? Before Abraham was, he didn't say, I was. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say before Abraham yeah. was, I was, which is good grammar. Mm -hmm. He says before I Abraham was, I was, am. I am. Claim to deity. Yes, absolutely. And it, this is, I mean, this, it's beautiful because I think that this is exactly the problem of uh, so many people around the world. They, they lack the understanding of two things, the Old Testament text as well as the uh, Jewish understanding of things 2,000 years ago. Because again, no one accused him for being the Messiah. The accusation and the blasphemy referred to him being God. Yes. And, and if he was, let's, let's put it this way, if he was handed to the Romans to be crucified for being God, that means that that's exactly what he claimed to be what's exactly what they claimed that he said. Correct. And he was willing to take it all the way to the cross because right. it's true. He never refuted he that. He never refuted that. In fact, he, he testified, you will see the Son of Man seated in power, the right hand of power. Uh, by virtue of the fact that he quotes Daniel 7 and applies it to himself, it, oh, he's absolutely it's absolutely saying is I participate in the divine nature. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of Christian cults or sects that deny the deity of Christ. And uh, one of the things they say that there's not that many verses uh, in the New Testament that actually state explicitly that Yeshua, Jesus, is God. So how would you respond to this statement? Yeah, it's a, something I've thought about for many, many years. And I really do think that, you know, the whole notion of the deity of Jesus has profound impact on everything you understand about salvation. Exactly. And, the smaller Jesus is, the bigger you have to be in salvation, mm -hmm. right? There's a correspondence between a low Christology and what we would call salvation by works. Yep. So in Jehovah Witnesses, right, they have to work really hard because Jesus isn't God. He needs help, right? He needs help for us to be saved. But what I would argue is that um, as I've thought through the issue of the deity of Jesus, I see it resting on four pillars. And really, I, to me, these four pillars are crucial in discussing the deity of Jesus. The first pillar would be, before we even get to, is Jesus God? Does the Old Testament teach that the Messiah is God? Yes. Right? And I think that there's really good, wonderful passage. We just looked at one in Daniel. Yes. So it that's is. the first pillar. The second pillar mm -hmm. are those verses in the New Testament that, that, that actually there's a direct statement yep. that Jesus is God. You'll be surprised to hear that, yes, there are not a lot of verses that say that Jesus is God. There are some, though, that are quite clear. So John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, yeah. the Word was with God, the Word was yeah. God, okay? But there are two other pillars that are completely overlooked, and I think that they're the most important, 
and I think that they show overwhelmingly that Jesus is God. Mm. The third pillar are the verses in the New Testament that attribute to Jesus actions, statements, and attributes that belong exclusively to God. In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. Uh, the stilling of the storm. Absolutely. In Mark chapter 4, yes. um, in Mark chapter 4, it's an amazing passage that has a lot of parallels to the story of Jonah. So he's on the ship, he falls asleep, there's a storm, the sailors, the disciples wake him up, don't you care that we're going to perish? Yeah. The storm is, is, is settled and then it says that the disciples feel, feared a great fear. Mm -hmm. This is in Mark. Well, what's really interesting is that when you start to look at the parallels between Jonah chapter 1 and the story of Jesus, now obviously Jesus is not like the prophet Jonah who's running no, away. Course. That's clear. But what's clear is that there are some parallels between the story, but suddenly you realize, who is it that calms the storm? Yes, Psalm 89, verse 8 and 9. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Who calms the storm? It's Jesus. And all of a sudden, you realize, when you look through the whole Old Testament, one of the attributes of God that separates God from all of, create, of creation yeah. is God's ability to to control weather, yeah. to calm storms. Mm -hmm. That's exclusively a divine action. So when the disciples say, who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? That brings us back also to chapter two of Mark. Who is this that can forgive sins but yeah. God alone? Exactly. And so here you have a, 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 a classic example of an action that Jesus does in the New Testament that exclusively belongs to God. Mm. And then there's a fourth pillar, very powerful. The fourth pillar is really remarkable in that the New Testament, we know this, constantly either quotes the Old Testament or alludes to the Old Testament. And you have so many times where the New Testament writers take a passage from the Old Testament and, and quote it as referring to Jesus. It's Jesus. But then you look back in the Old Testament and who's it about? God. Yudei Bave, the yes, Lord, the God, Lord. Jehovah. Jehovah. And so either either they're blaspheming themselves or it's clear to them that Jesus yes. has to be God. And again, what's remarkable is we're talking about Jews first, in the second temple period well, who had a very strong temple, notion. Yes, exactly. So I'll get one example, I'll give mm -hmm. you one of the most amazing examples in Philippians. Yeah. Philippians chapter 2. Okay. Philippians. We know the passage in Philippians chapter 2. Here it is, yeah. So notice in verse 6, yep. it says that he existed in the form of God, but he didn't regard what? Equality, equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Full equality with God. But then we go on, and I want you to notice in verse, verse 9. If you want to read, why don't you read verse 9? Yeah, verse 9 Verse says, 9 through 11. Okay, so it says like this. Um, <clears throat> it says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what people don't realize here is that Paul is actually taking a passage, and Bible scholars agree on this, whether they're believers or not, Paul used Israel scriptures. Paul was Jewish. Paul's Bible was the Hebrew Bible. Obviously, he didn't know the New Testament. He wrote the New exactly. Testament. Exactly. We're coming now to uh, one of the most important topics in this whole interview. And that's the one that is really close to my heart because I, be, I do believe with all of my heart that it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of, you know, being lost or being saved. Yes. And, and that I'm talking about is... Do you think the belief in Yeshua's deity is essential for salvation? And I'm saying that it has to be super clear. It, it has to be super clear. Can someone call himself a Christian, born again, spirit-filled Christian, yet deny the deity of Jesus? Okay, so you don't even need to ask me. You can ask Paul the Apostle. Let's ask Paul the Apostle. So let's look at Romans chapter 11. Let's go uh, to, Romans 10, sorry. Let's go to Romans, Romans 10. chapter 10. Romans, the Magna Carta of our faith. Uh, let's go to um, 
Romans chapter 10, and in chapter 10, look what he says. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to read a couple of passages here. I'm going to start in, in verse, well, I'll start in verse 8. Would that be okay? Yep. Go but what ahead. does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. What's the yeah. word of faith we are preaching? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Lord. The Greek here is kurios. Kurios. Kurios, which can yes. be like in, in Hebrew, adon. Adon. Can yes. mean sir. And that's can what mean he says Lord, in the Hebrew here. But can adon. also mean divine. Correct. Okay. So if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, you will, will be, be saved. saved. Okay. You actually have to confess that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Well, does he mean here only sir? Well. Well, let's keep going. Yeah. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord, mm -hmm. who's Lord here? Jesus. Yes, We've already said yes. that. You have to confess that he's Lord. Is Lord over all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Look at this. <laughs> Romans, Romans 10 for, verse 13. For whoever... Call. Whoever will call on the name and of the Lord. Yes. And in Hebrew is Jehovah. Who, and, Jehovah. Who will ever call on the name of the Lord, the Lord will be saved. And that is from... Paul is quoting. What's he quoting from? He's quoting from Joel chapter 2 verse 32. Joel chapter 32 verse 32. In the, in the, in the English it's 232. In Hebrew it's 3.1 yes. or 3.5 I believe it is. Mm -hmm. But here's what's remarkable. Paul quotes a passage... About it's salvation. About salvation in the Old Testament. Yep. Whoever calls in the name of yud heh vav -He yeah. will be saved. And he we, is that Lord. He is that Lord. So if we do not confess with our mouth that Jesus is, is that Lord, that Lord yes. we cannot be saved. It's it so is, powerful. It is fundamental to our salvation. This is Paul saying <laughs> Absolutely. this, not Seth. By saying that he is God, it is no longer essential for you to work your salvation in a way but because he has done it all <laughs> I and, love and, it. and so we do not preach salvation through works no it's through him but we need to make sure you understand who he is so and I, do you I, think by the way that when jesus says i do not know you do you think that the, those people that said lord lord do you think that there's a chance that these people never understood or knew him as God? Well, listen, again, what the, in that particular context, I would have to look at it more carefully, yes. okay? What I like to do is I like to look at the passages that are very clear. And if you look at Romans chapter 10, yeah. that Super is clear. so unbelievably clear. Interestingly enough, what's remarkable, Paul's, or Peter's first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, he quotes this passage as well. Exactly. He says, exactly. Those who, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm -hmm. So his Speaking first, about him. His first sermon, yep. Peter, in his very first sermon, Peter quotes this passage about Jesus. In yep. other words, right yep. off the bat. Verse 21. Exactly. You have to believe that Jesus is Lord. Yep. We can say with great confidence that biblically, you cannot be saved unless you believe that Jesus is God. You have to confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Lord. And that same Lord that we see the in Lord Joel the chapter Testament. 2 and, of course, as Romans chapter 10 in uh, Acts chapter 2 is talking about. That's, that's, that's powerful, it's important, and it's overlooked often by so many. You know, it's remarkable again, Amir. So, again, people will say that belief in Jesus as God was a very slow development within Gentile Christianity, yeah. that it happened over time. But Paul's very, or Peter's very first sermon to the Jewish people was in Acts chapter that. 2, he takes the passage in Joel, Joel, all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved, he applies it to Jesus. In other words, from the very first sermon, public sermon after the Holy Spirit came upon the, on the, the early believers, they immediately proclaimed that Jesus was God. Mm. We're coming to the conclusion of our interview here, and it's been unbelievable. I mean, I think that uh, what you did, Seth, is um, you really help people explain what they already believe or 
finally understand what they couldn't understand before. Uh, but there are a couple scriptures, such as Colossians 1.15, speaking of Jesus, the firstborn of creation, and John 14.28, saying, The Father is greater than I, which seems to be not completely uh, putting Jesus completely equal with God. How will you respond to that? And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because we're here to talk straightforward yes. and to tackle those things that people always hang on to yes. as a proof that He is not God. So right. how would you respond to that? So, okay, let's start with the firstborn from the dead, all right? The, yes. fir the firstborn of all creation. So let me ask you a question. Who was Abraham's firstborn? Of course, Ishmael, but... Was, it, was Ishmael Abraham's firstborn? That's what's really interesting. He wasn't. Why? Because God chose Isaac. Isaac. In well, other words, I see. firstborn has nothing to, to do, do with, with, with when you were born. It's it the has to, status. The title. status. Yeah. The status. Who so, basically... So, so Abraham's firstborn is not Ishmael. It is not although, Ishmael. Although... Chronologically, he was born first. Born first. He was born first. But he is not the firstborn. Exactly. And so, really, in Psalm 89, where it talks about the fact that God will establish the Messiah as firstborn over all creation, what that means, and, and he explains it later on, that creation was created through the Messiah, by the Messiah, for the Messiah. He is the inheritor of everything that Amazing. God has ever made. He's the firstborn. And guess what? When we believe in Jesus, we become co-heirs. Yes. We become his children. And so the, the word here that firstborn, to suggest that it means born first, shows me that they're trying to understand this verse without the Old Testament background. Absolutely. So there's, there's a classic example. Now what about the father is greater than Correct. I Correct. John? John 14, 28. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, go to John 14, verse 12. Okay, so here's John 14. I'm, 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 I'm here at John 14, verse 12. So here it is. And it says the following thing. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I, I will do it. Okay, so here Jesus says to his followers, you're going to do greater, same word in Greek. Correct. It's the same word. Correct. You're going to do greater works than I did. Yes. Okay, so what does that mean? So we're going to die for people? No. We're going to, in other words, you, you have to qualify the statement. Correct. Greater in what sense? In every sense? That would be blasphemy. Correct. That would be a denial of our faith that we're going to do greater things mm -hmm. than Jesus because there were things that Jesus did Nobody can. that affirmed his divine nature. So we cannot say we're God. I can't do the things that make Jesus yes. God, right? And so you have to qualify. So when Jesus says that the Father is greater than I, the Greek doesn't mean that he's greater in everything. He's greater in some things. And I do believe, interestingly enough, that that the father and son are fully equal. Just like a husband and wife are fully equal, as my view, they're fully equal. But they are they have but, different roles. But they have different roles. And so the, the son submits to the father, not my will, but yours be done. There is a hierarchy of roles, but not a hierarchy in of divine worth. status. Yes. Yes. Because if you make Jesus a lesser deity, then guess what? You've replaced biblical faith with Greek mythology. That's true. Because in Greek mythology, there, there, are, are, there are levels of deity. And so anybody that would claim that Jesus is a lesser deity, lesser in divinity, has suddenly abandoned biblical faith and they've become a Greek pagan. Amazing. I want to share with you, uh, just to conclude this whole thing, statistic that is pretty shocking. Believe it or not, but most so-called Christian, people who claim that they're not Muslims, they're not Jews, they're not Hindus, they're not Sikhs, they're, they're Christians. That's how they, they, they categorize themselves. Most of them do not fully believe in the deity of Christ or do not understand 
what it means. Because if you elevate someone else, such as Mary, to the same level, then you don't understand the deity. Uh, and, and, and isn't that shocking that 2,000 years later, after the writings of the first century, the Jewish writings, and after everything we see in his, way, in his words, in his actions, in attributes, in his nature, everything, still most people on planet Earth that call themselves Christians do not understand or agree. By the way, they, they, they had a poll done uh, recently and I'm not sure if it was 40 or, or 30 or 40 percent of, of evangelicals in America, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if it was 40 or, that actually believed Jesus was created. Hmm. And it, this is so sad. So let me just make a clarification here. Okay. Uh, I would say 100 percent of evangelicals believe that Jesus is God. The moment you say he's not, you're no longer evangelical. That's true. In other words, the bottom line is this. Um, the scriptures are unbelievably clear. And again, as Jewish believers, um, you and I, you know, we value very much the importance of understanding the biblical Jesus in light of the Old Testament. Yes. And as soon as you start to do that, you can come to no other conclusion Absolutely. other than the fact that Jesus participates fully in the, de in the deity of God. He is fully God. Absolutely. The bottom line, and we already touched on this, but it is to me, it's so crucial. To the extent that Jesus becomes smaller, you become bigger. And you'll notice a lot of these movements that emphasize things instead of Jesus, they're very busy. And so I like to joke, and, and it's gonna, what I'm about to say is going to sound heretical, so bear with me till the okay, end. Okay, I'm being accused uh, for being heretical anyway. I like to joke that we really are saved by works, not our own. Yeah, exactly. We are his saved works. by His works Absolutely. from start to finish. And the moment you understand who Jesus is, you understand His deity and His humanity yes. together, you start to recognize that salvation is completely a gift from start to finish. Amen. And, and then suddenly good works become a fruit. Exactly. It's, it's the, the fruit. fruit. And it's not the yeah. way yeah. to salvation. Correct. It's the fruit of your already existing salvation. This Correct. is so important. Anyone that suggests that Jesus is not God and that we must add to it something cannot by definition be saved. Yeah. And this is and we're not here to blame or accuse. We're here to explain and teach so you will understand and you will come to that conclusion so you will be saved. We, that's what we want. We want people to be saved, but on the grounds of Romans 10, on the grounds of, of the things that you must be able to say and believe in and to, and to confess and believe in, in order to be saved. So think about the, the, the doctrine of works-based salvation. Yeah. You can never rest. Never. Okay. Jesus says to me, come to me. All and who are weary and heavy, yes. and I will give you rest. Well, who's the giver of rest in the, according to the Bible? God. God. The only way you can ever experience if that it's, verse it's, in its, its fullness, the only way you'll ever experience rest, is if you believe that He is God. And that He's done it all. Seth, let's move to the practical level of, of, of things. Why, from a practical point of view, it's important that the believer will have an understanding of the uh, of the uh, divine nature of the Messiah. I'll tell you, I'll give you an, an answer with a story. Okay. Years ago, my daughter um, was not listening to me. She was young. And I told her, sweetheart, if you disobey me again, I'm taking you into the room and you're going to get a spanking. <laughs> she disobeyed. We went into the room and I said, why are you here? She said, I disobeyed you. What did daddy say would happen? You said you'd give me a spanking. Does daddy love you? Yes. And her lips started to come out and quiver. It got, you know, you know, you've, you've, she was yes. right. And at that moment, I rolled up my sleeve and she got very scared. She'd never seen daddy roll up his sleeve like that. And I looked at her and I said, Yael, you deserve a spanking because you disobeyed daddy. 
but daddy loves you very, very, very much. And because daddy loves you, I'm going to take your spanking in your place. And I started to beat my arm really hard in front of her. And she was crying. And I said, yeah, what, what just happened here? She said, you took my spanking. Why did daddy do it? Because you love me. I said, did daddy deserve that spanking? No, I did. Why did daddy do it? Because you love me. I think we've hit the heart of the gospel. And that is, is that, you know, the story of Passover, God didn't send an angel to rescue us. He came himself. Mm -hmm. That's the whole story of the Passover. God came himself. And so when we, we needed to be rescued, and so God didn't want to give glory to anybody else, including ourselves. There's nothing we can contribute to our salvation. God gets all the glory and God demonstrates his love in the cross. That God, at the perfect time, he, he became a man so that he could die in our place. So that if we ever doubt the love of God, we look at the cross and we say, God, you paid such an amazing price. I think that really the bottom line is that God gets all the glory in our salvation, that Jesus is fully God. Mm -hmm. In any other equation, we'll never understand the love of God. We'll never understand mm -hmm. the love of God and we'll always want to add yes. to our salvation. So there's we'll nothing we can things. add to nothing this one. Nothing at all. He loves us perfectly and he demonstrated his perfect love by putting on flesh and taking our spanking. What a great time we had together. Dr. Seth Postel, I know that you wrote some books and you contributed to some others. So please, if you don't mind, let us know a little bit sure. about them. Okay? Yeah, with pleasure. So, so, um, so this is a book. So um, as you mentioned, I serve with One for Israel yeah. at the Bible College. I am the academic dean of One for Israel. and. We just, um, we have a passion to share God's word and to train and to, to reach Jewish people and mm -hmm. train up Arabs and, and Jews. And so we wrote this book. One of the questions that we constantly get, I don't know which way to, yes. which angle. So, so one reading, of the questions Mo we, reading Moses, seeing Jesus. It's basically. a constant question that we get is about the Torah and the law and should we keep these laws? And, and so we wrote a book that basically deals with how a faithful reading of the Torah brings mm -hmm. you to Jesus. Yes. My colleague, then, yes. Eitan Barr, he wrote a book that basically shows that Jewish oral law yeah. is, is a, it's, it's the myth. It's, it's, a myth. it's a myth that God didn't yeah. give an oral law from True. heaven. And this is the Hebrew one, and Dr. Golan Broshi, who, whom we also hosted, uh, is one of the co-authors. And this is being translated as we speak to English as yes. well. So okay. this, is, this is a book I, I wrote. It actually was my dissertation. Okay. It's called Adam is Israel. And again, the point of this book, the dissertation, was to show how the early chapters of Genesis basically already anticipate the fact that we are going to need a Messiah and the New Covenant. Wow. And so that's that. Adam as Israel. Adam as Israel. Okay. And then this book, actually, I was a contributor. So this is a wonderful book I've known um, from Moody Bible Institute. Correct. So I was, I think I wrote, I think, nine or ten articles uh, about how the Hebrew Bible is Messianic and how it points to Jesus. And, so and I that's, recommend of course, this as the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy, Michael Rydelnik and Edwin Bloom. And, uh, and you, of course, contributed about nine to ten of the episodes there. Why, uh, why is it so important that people understand this from the Jewish angle, from the local angle? Yeah. Why is it so important? Sure. I would just simply argue that to, we want to understand Jesus in his context. Yes. And the moment we try to understand Jesus outside of his context, we it's no out. longer Jesus. Yeah. So if you try to read the New Testament without the Old Testament, yeah. you get a new religion. Absolutely. You try to read Jesus apart from being Jewish, yeah. you're going to make a new Jesus. So he didn't die as a Jew and resurrected as a non-Jew. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. He's still the son of David. Absolutely. He still has a Jewish mother. Yeah. Which means, interestingly enough, if Jesus died a Jew and rose as a non-Jew, that would mean he rose as no longer the Messiah. 
Correct. Because the Messiah has to be the son of David. Absolutely. Jesus is eternally Jewish. Yeah, and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Amen.